Ministers to Teach Health Reform Our ministers should become intelligent on health reform. They should understand the laws that govern physical life in their bearing upon the health of mind and soul. Thousands upon thousands know little of the wonderful body God has given them or of the care it should receive. They consider it of more importance to study subjects of far less consequence. The ministers have a work to do here. When they take a right position on the subject, much will be gained. In their own lives and homes, they should obey the laws of life, practicing right principles and living healthfully. Then they will be able to speak correctly on the subject, leading the people higher and still higher in the work of reform. Living in the light themselves, they can bear a message of great value to those who are in need of just such testimony. There are precious blessings and a rich experience to be gained if ministers will combine the presentation of the health question with all their labors in the churches. The people must have the light on health reform. This work has been neglected, and many are ready to die because they need the light which they ought to have and must have before they will give up selfish indulgences. The presidents of our conferences need to realize that it is high time they were placing themselves on the right side of this question. Ministers and teachers are to give to others the light they have received. Their work in every line is needed. God will help them. He will strengthen his servants who stand firm and will not be swayed from truth and righteousness in order to accommodate self-indulgence. The light that the Lord has given on the subject in his word is plain, and men will be tested and tried in many ways to see if they will heed it. Every church... Every family needs to be instructed in regard to Christian temperance. All should know how to eat and drink in order to preserve health. We are amid the closing scenes of the world's history, and there should be harmonious action in the ranks of Sabbath keepers. Those who stand aloof from the great work of instructing the people upon this question do not follow where the great physician leads the way. The gospel and the medical missionary work are to advance together. The gospel is to be bound up with the principles of true health reform. Christianity is to be brought into the practical life. Earnest, thorough, reformatory work is to be done. True Bible religion is an outflowing of the love of God for fallen man. God's people are to advance in straightforward lines to impress the hearts of those who are seeking for truth, who desire to act their part aright in this intensely earnest age. We are to present the principles of health reform before the people, doing all in our power to lead men and women to see the necessity of these principles and to practice them. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, pages 376 to 379. How to present the principles of health reform. The Lord desires our ministers, physicians, and church members to be careful not to urge those who are ignorant of our faith to make sudden changes in diet thus bringing men to a premature test. Hold up the principles of health reform and let the Lord lead the honest in heart. They will hear and believe. Nor does the Lord require his messengers to present the beautiful truths of healthful living in a way that will prejudice minds, that no one put stumbling blocks before the feet that are walking in the dark paths of ignorance. Even in praising a good thing, it is not well to be too enthusiastic lest you turn out of the way those who come to hear. Present the principles of temperance in their most attractive form. We must not move presumptuously. The laborers who enter new territory to raise up churches must not create difficulties by attempting to make prominent the question of diet. They should be careful not to draw the lines too closely, for impediments would thus be thrown in the path of others. Do not drive the people. Lead them. Wherever the truth is carried, instruction should be given in regard to the preparation of wholesome foods. God desires that in every place the people should be taught by skillful teachers how to utilize wisely the products that they can raise or readily obtain in their section of the country. Thus the poor, as well as those in better circumstances, can be taught to live healthfully. The Minister and Manual Work while Paul was careful to set before his converts the plain teaching of Scripture regarding the proper support of the work of God, and while he claimed for himself as a minister of the gospel the power to forbear working, 1 Corinthians 9, 6, at secular employment as a means of self-support, 
Yet at various times during his ministry in the great centers of civilization, he wrought at handicraft for his own maintenance. It is at Thessalonica that we first read of Paul's working with his hands and self-supporting labor while preaching the word. Writing to the church of believers there, he reminded them that he might have been burdensome to them and added, Ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail. For laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 and 9. And again, in the second epistle to them, he declared that he and his fellow laborer, while with them, had not eaten any man's bread for naught. Night and day we worked, he wrote, that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. When Paul first visited Corinth, he found himself among a people who were suspicious of the motives of strangers. The Greeks on the sea coast were keen traders. So long had they trained themselves in sharp business practices that they had come to believe that gain was godliness and that to make money, whether by fair means or foul, was commendable. Paul was acquainted with their characteristics, and he would give them no occasion for saying that he preached the gospel in order to enrich himself. He might justly have claimed support from his Corinthian hearers, but this right he was willing to forego, lest his usefulness and success as a minister should be injured by the unjust suspicion that he was preaching the gospel for gain. He would seek to remove all occasion for misrepresentation, that the force of his message might not be lost. Soon after his arrival at Corinth, Paul found a certain Jew named Aquila, Bonum Pontus, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla. These were of the same craft with himself. Banished by the decree of Claudius, which commanded all Jews to leave Rome, Aquila and Priscilla had come to Corinth, where they established a business as manufacturers of tents. Paul made inquiry concerning them, and learned that they feared God and were seeking to avoid the contaminating influences with which they were surrounded. He abode with them and wrought. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Acts 18, verses 2 to 4. During the long period of his ministry in Ephesus, where for three years he carried forward an aggressive evangelistic effort throughout that region, Paul again worked at his trade. In Ephesus, as in Corinth, the apostle was cheered by the presence of Aquila and Priscilla, who had accompanied him on his return to Asia at the close of a second missionary journey. There were some who objected to Paul's toiling with his hands, declaring that it was inconsistent with the work of a gospel minister. Why should Paul, a minister of the highest rank, thus connect mechanical work with the preaching of the word? Was not the laborer worthy of his hire? Why should he spend in making tens time that to all appearance could be put to better account? But Paul did not regard as lost the time thus spent. As he worked with Aquila, he kept in touch with the great teacher, losing no opportunity of witnessing for the Savior and of helping those who needed help. His mind was ever reaching out for spiritual knowledge. He gave his fellow workers instruction in spiritual things. He also set an example of industry and thoroughness. He was a quick, skillful worker, diligent in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Romans 12, 11. As he worked at his trade, the apostle had access to a class of people that he could not otherwise have reached. He showed his associates that skill in the common arts is a gift from God, who provides both the gift and the wisdom to use it aright. He taught that even in everyday toil, God is to be honored. His toil-hardened hands detracted nothing from the force of his pathetic appeals as a Christian minister. If ministers feel that they are suffering hardships and privation in the cause of Christ, let them, in imagination, visit the workshop where Paul labored. Let them bear in mind that while this chosen man of God is fashioning the canvas, he is working for bread, which he has justly earned by his labors as an apostle. Work is a blessing, not a curse. A spirit of indolence destroys godliness and grieves the spirit of God. A stagnant pool is offensive, 
but a pure, flowing stream spreads health and gladness over the land. Paul knew that those who neglected physical work soon became enfeebled. He desired to teach young ministers that by working with their hands, by bringing into exercise their muscles and sinews, they would become strong to endure the toils and privations that awaited them in the gospel field. And he realized that his own teachings would lack vitality and force if he did not keep all parts of the system properly exercised. Not all who feel that they have been called to preach should be encouraged to throw themselves and their families at once upon the church for continuous financial support. There is danger that some of the limited experience may be spoiled by flattery and by unwise encouragement to expect full support independent of any serious effort on their part. The means dedicated to the extension of the work of God should not be consumed by men who desire to preach only that they may receive support and thus gratify a selfish ambition for an easy life. Young men who desire to exercise their gifts in the work of the ministry will find a helpful lesson in the example of Paul at Thessalonica, Corinth, Ephesus, and other places. Although an eloquent speaker and chosen by God to do a special work, he was never above labor, nor did he ever weary of sacrificing for the cause he loved. Even unto this present hour, he wrote to the Corinthians, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place, and labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. 1 Corinthians 4, verses 11, 12. One of the greatest of human teachers, Paul cheerfully performed the lowliest as well as the highest duties. When in his service for the master, circumstances seemed to require it, he willingly labored at his trade. Nevertheless, he ever held himself ready to lay aside his secular work in order to meet the opposition of the enemies of the gospel or to improve a special opportunity to win souls to Jesus. His zeal and industry are a rebuke to indolence and a desire for ease. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 346 to 355. The failure of some of our ministers to exercise all the organs of the body proportionally causes some organs to become worn, while others are weak from inaction. If wear is left to come almost exclusively upon one organ or set of muscles, the one most used must become overwearied and greatly weakened. Each faculty of the mind and each muscle has its distinctive office, and all must be equally exercised in order to become properly developed and to retain healthful vigor. Each organ has its work to do in the living organism. Every wheel in the machinery must be living, active, working wheel. All the facilities have a bearing upon one another, and all need to be exercised in order to be properly developed. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 310. Our duty to preserve health. I am pained at heart as I see so many feeble ministers, so many on beds of sickness, so many prematurely closing their earthly history, Many who have carried the burden of responsibility in the work of God, and his whole heart was in their work. The conviction that they must seize their labor in the cause they loved was far more painful to them than their sufferings from disease, or even the thought of death itself. Our Heavenly Father does not willingly afflict or grieve the children of men. He is not the author of sickness and death. He is the source of life. He would have men live and he desires them to be obedient to the laws of life and health that they may live. Those who accept the present truth and are sanctified through it have an intense desire to represent the truth in their life and character. They have a deep yearning of soul that others may see the light and rejoice in it. As the true watchman goes forth bearing precious seed, sowing beside all waters, weeping and praying, the burden of labor is very taxing to mind and heart. He cannot keep up the strain continuously. His soul stirred to the very depths without wearing out prematurely. Strength and efficiency are needed in every discourse. And from time to time, fresh supplies of things, new and old, need to be brought forth from the storehouse of God's Word. This will impart life and power to the hearers. God does not want you to become so exhausted that your efforts have no freshness or life. Those who are engaged in constant mental labor, whether in studying or preaching, need rest and change. The earnest student is constantly taxing the brain, 
too often while neglecting physical exercise. And as the result, the bodily powers are enfeebled and mental effort is restricted. Thus the student fails of accomplishing the very work that he might have done had he labored wisely. If they worked intelligently, giving both mind and body a due share of exercise, ministers will not so readily succumb to disease. If all our workers were so situated that they could spend a few hours each day in outdoor labor and fell free to do this, it would be a blessing to them. They would be able to discharge more successfully the duties of their calling. If they have not time for complete relaxation, they could be planning and praying while at work with their hands and could return to their labor refreshed in body and spirit. Some of our ministers feel that they must every day perform some labor that they can report to the conference. And as the result of trying to do this, their efforts are too weak and inefficient. They should have periods of rest, of entire freedom from taxing labor. But these cannot take the place of daily physical exercise. Brethren, when you take time to cultivate your garden, thus gaining the exercise needed to keep the system in good working order, you are just as much doing the work of God as in holding meetings. God is our Father. He loves us. He does not require any of his servants to abuse their bodies. Another cause of ill health and of inefficiency in labor is indigestion. It is impossible for the brain to do its best work when the digestive powers are abused. Many eat hurriedly of various kinds of food, which set up a war in the stomach and thus confuse the brain. The use of unhealthful food and overeating of even that which is wholesome should alike be avoided. Many eat at all hours regardless of the laws of health. Then gloom covers the mind. How can men be honored with divine enlightenment when they are so reckless in their habits, so inattentive to the light which God has given in regard to these things? Brethren, is it not time for you to be converted on these points of selfish indulgence? Know ye not that they which run in the race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they that do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it under subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Subheading, Insufficient Diet. Do not, however, feel it your duty to live on an insufficient diet. Learn for yourselves what you should eat, what kinds of food best nourish the body, and then follow the dictates of reason and conscience. At mealtime, cast off care and taxing thought. Do not be hurried, but eat slowly and with cheerfulness, your heart filled with gratitude to God for all his blessings. And do not engage in brain labor immediately after a meal. Exercise moderately and give a little time for the stomach to begin its work. These are not matters of trifling importance. We must pay attention to them if healthful vigor and a right tone are to be given to the various branches of the work. The character and efficiency of the work depend largely upon the physical condition of the workers. Many committee meetings and other meetings for council have taken an unhappy tone from the dyspeptic condition of those assembled. And many a sermon has received a dark shadow from the minister's indigestion. Health is an inestimable blessing and one which is more closely related to conscience and religion than many realize. It has a great deal to do with one's capability. Every minister should feel that if he would be a faithful guardian of the flock, he must preserve all his powers and condition for the best possible service. Our workers should use their knowledge of the laws of life and health. Read the best authors on these subjects and obey religiously that which your reason tells you is truth. The Lord has presented before me that many, many will be rescued from physical, mental, and moral degeneracy through the practical influence of health reform. Health talks will be given. Publications will be multiplied. The principles of health reform will be received with favor 
and many will advance step by step to receive these special truths for this time. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, pages 378-379. Danger from Overwork When the apostles returned from their missionary journey, the Savior's command to them was, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. Mark 6, 31. They had been putting their whole souls into labor for the people, and this was exhausting their physical and mental strength. It was their duty to rest. Christ's words of compassion are spoken to his workers today, just as surely as to his disciples. Come ye yourselves apart and rest a while, he says to those who are worn and weary. It is not wise to be always under the strain of work and excitement, even in ministering to men's spiritual needs. For in this way, personal piety is neglected, and the powers of mind and soul and body are overtaxed. Self-denial is required of the servants of Christ, and sacrifices must be made. But God would have all study the laws of health and use reason when working for him that the life which he has given may be preserved. Though Jesus could work miracles and had empowered his disciples to work miracles, he directed his warned servants to go apart into the country and rest. When he said that the harvest was great and the laborers were few, he did not urge upon his disciples the necessity of ceaseless toil, but said, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Matthew 9:38. God has appointed to every man his work according to his ability, and he would not have a few weighted with responsibilities while others have no burden, no travail of soul. The servants of Christ are not to treat their health indifferently. Let no one labor to the point of exhaustion, thereby disqualifying himself for future effort. Do not try to crowd into one day the work of two. At the end... Those who work carefully and wisely will be found to have accomplished as much as those who so expend their physical and mental strength that they have no deposit from which to draw in time of need. God's work is worldwide. It calls for every jot and tittle of the ability and power that we have. There is danger that his workers will abuse their powers as they see that the field is ripe for the harvest. But the Lord does not require this. After servants have done their best, they may say, The harvest truly is great, and the laborers are few. But God knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. Psalms 103, 14. Intemperance in eating and drinking, intemperance in labor, intemperance in almost everything exists on every hand. Those who make great exertions to accomplish just so much in a given time and continue to labor when their judgment tells them that they ought to rest are never gainers. They are expending force that they will need at a future time. When the energy which they have so recklessly used is called for, they fail for lack of it. Physical strength is gone, and mental power is unavailable. The time of need has come, and their resources are exhausted. Each day brings its responsibilities and duties, but the work of tomorrow need not be crowded into the hours of today. God is merciful, full of compassion, reasonable in his requirements. He does not ask us to pursue a course of action that will result in the loss of physical health or the enfeebling of the mental powers. He would not have us work under a pressure and strain until exhaustion follows with prostration of the nerves. There is need that God's chosen workmen should listen to the command to go apart and rest a while. Many valuable lives have been sacrificed because of a disregard of this command. There are those who might be with us today to help forward the cause both at home and in foreign lands had they but realized before it was too late that they were in need of rest. These workers saw that the field is large and the need for work is great, and they felt that at any cost they must press on. When nature uttered a protest, they paid no heed, but did trouble the work they should have done. And God laid them in the grave to rest until the last trump shall sound to call the righteous forth to immortality. When a laborer has been under heavy pressure of care and anxiety and is overworked in both body and mind, he should turn aside and rest a while, 
not for selfish gratification, but that he may be better prepared for future duties. We have a vigilant foe who is ever on our track, ready to take advantage of every weakness that would help to make his temptations effective. When the mind is overstrained and the body enfeebled, he presses upon the soul his fiercest temptations. Let the laborer carefully husband his strength, and when wearied with toil, let him turn aside and commune with Jesus. I do not say this to those who are constitutionally tired, those who think they are carrying heavier burdens than anyone else. Those who do not labor have no need of rest. There are always those who spare themselves and who come far short of bearing their share of responsibility. They can talk of great and crushing burdens, but they do not know what it means to bear them. Their work yields but meager results. It was to those worn down in his service, not to those who are always sparing themselves, that Christ addressed his gracious words. And today, it is to the self-forgetful, those who work to the very extent of their ability, who are distressed because they cannot do more, and who in their zeal go beyond their strength, that the Savior says, Come ye yourselves apart and rest a while. In all who are under the training of God is to be revealed a life that is not in harmony with the world, its customs, or its practices. And every one needs to have a personal experience in obtaining a knowledge of the will of God. He bids us, Be still and know that I am God. Psalms 46.10 Here alone can true rest be found, and this is the effectual preparation for all labor for God. Amid the hurrying throng and the strain of life's intense activities, the soul that is thus refreshed will be surrounded with an atmosphere of light and peace. The life will breathe out fragrance and will reveal a divine power that will reach men's hearts. The Desire of Ages, pages 363.